So it gives me great pleasure to be the person to introduce Jane Burns, who is the CEO of the Young and Well Cooperative Research Centre. Um, she did a lot of work pushing the youth agenda at Beyond Blue, which is the Australian National Depression Initiative, when it was in its startup stage. Were you one of the most influential women in Australia? Jane, as well. <laughs> She was also one of the most influential women in Australia. I think that's pretty important as well. And a Vic Health Principal Research Fellowship at Origin Youth Health Research Centre. So if everyone can welcome Jane, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. And um, <laughs> Lauren and I are going to try to attempt the impossible, which is for us to co-present, and then we're going to get Ian Hickey up on stage. I know he's back there asleep. Um, down in the seat, um, but we are going to get him up on stage because what we want to do is provide you with an example of how a young person working with a professional on an even kill can actually make a massive difference around the use of technologies. And I know we've talked a little bit about technology and the challenges and the dangers. What we're going to talk about is how we can use it for potential good. Um, so I am from the Young and Well CRC. I am also mum to three children. Harry, my youngest, is three, and Harry is a delicate petal. So he's my little boy who holds on to me, who cuddles me, who um, cries at the drop of a hat if you raise your voice. He's delicate. Holly, my five-year-old, is incredibly robust. She'll have a vomit. Blah. Can I have a cake, mummy? And she is going to be one of those kids that just bounces back continually. And Angus, my beautiful, beautiful Angus, who is seven tomorrow, Angus has both, I just want to put that down, has both Down syndrome and was born and diagnosed with Down syndrome um, at birth, but also autism. And so for six years, um, we have used sign language. And every night I'd put him to bed and I'd say, I love you. And for six years I did that, I love you. And for six years I didn't get a response and I'd, I'd get a hug or I'd get, you know, a smile. He doesn't speak. And then one night, as I do, I put him to bed and I said, I love you. And he looked up and he had the biggest smile on his face and he said, I love you. And I think, if anything, Angus has taught me about the power of perseverance and the need to continue to push on through all of the challenges that life might throw at you. Um, because with that little sign of I love you, he taught me that you just have to keep going. And so while I run a Young and Well CRC, I am mum to three children. And for me, it's become very personal. I think it's been just so telling hearing the stories of what, her, what the experiences of young people and families has been. It's happening with my family in Australia at the, at the moment. And I hope that when my children reach their teenage years, that we're not still standing up on this stage and saying that this is the services that we provide. We need to get better at doing it. Um, and it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Young and Well CRC. Um, we are a cooperative research centre. For those of you who don't know, CRCs are funded by the Department of, Department of Innovation. So we're not funded by health, we're not funded by education, we're not funded by families. Innovation. And the idea behind it is to bring together researchers with professionals, with end users like the Inspire Foundation and Headspace and others in the audience, to say how do we actually do things better and how do we take on a, a, a big challenge. And most importantly for us, when we went to the Department of Innovation, we said to them the critical ingredient, we've got the researchers, we've got the policy makers, we've got um, the end user partners, but our young people are so incredibly important to the partnership. And we took a young person into interview and she spoke about her personal experience with bipolar disorder. Ian knows her well. Um, She's been at Brain and Mind Research Institute. And the government said, we absolutely believe in this model and we are going to fund you for the next five years to work in partnership. It's not a one-size-fits-all. There's not one solution. Not one organisation has it. We have to do it in partnership. So I make no apology for this slide. These are the 75-plus partners, 19 universities, 60 end-user partners, um, and the universities themselves are end-users because they work directly with young people. Um, many of them are in the audience. Many of our young people are here in the audience. And I'm going to hand over to Lauren to talk about what it means to be a Youth Brains Trust member and why technology is such a critical and important part in this journey as we go forward. 
Um, I guess one of the important points that I wanted to make here um, was really to echo what Carly was saying earlier about um, tokenism and involvement of young people. So the Youth Brains Trust, I feel like we're not just involved because we're young people. We're involved, I mean, yes, we're young people and that's why we're involved, but it's because we are the best people to give advice on what we're talking about. So we're the essential stakeholder. We, we are in the best position to talk about our experiences and um, what it's like for young people, what technology young people are using. So we, we are there because we're important, we're a valuable part of this process. In terms of technology, um, you know, we are digital natives. We talked a little bit on Monday about the role of technology in our lives um, and Aidan, who's here somewhere, is also a Youth Branch Trust member. And we talked a lot about how um, technology is blended seamlessly into our lives now. There is no you know, real world and online world for us. It's all just an extension of our social lives. It's an extension of our professional lives. Um, it's an extension of connections with family. It's just part of the way we do things. So it's exceptionally important that um, services are there in that online space. Um, something we also said on Monday, it, don't feel like people aren't gonna talk about you in the online space just because you're not there. We're talking about you, we're talking about experiences we're having. Um, we are using the information that's on the internet. So quite a few of the presentations over the last few days have identified that young people are turning to the internet first um, to find information and help seeking information. So um, it's exceptionally important. Yep. Lauren, do you want to talk about being in the Northern Territory and explaining about the fly-in, fly-outs and the challenge sure. of professional care? So the place that I live um, in Australia is the Northern Territory. So it's right up the... I live in Darwin. It's right up the top of, um, of Australia. And it's actually easier and cheaper for us to go to Asia than it is to go to any other capital city in the country that we live in, which is a really, really interesting place to, to be. But also about half of our population lives remotely. So they live... Um, it might be in a, in a community. We have a high proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And our average age in the Northern Territory is 32. So we have a huge population of young people. It's a really, really interesting place to live. Um, but it's also really hard for young people because living remotely, so you might live five hours drive out of your nearest centre. You might not have any access to infrastructure whatsoever. And there may be 25 services that say they um, service that particular community, but they're not consistent, they're not based in the community, and they're, they're fly in, fly out, if you like. So um, there are some communities that might see one psychologist one day a week, if that, if they're lucky. Um, so technology for me and my interest in joining the Youth Brains Trust in the first place was really about seeing how we could um, use technology to bridge some of those gaps um, and really increase access for young people where I live. We have um, some of the highest rates of suicide and youth suicide in the country, particularly with young Indigenous men. Um, it's really disgraceful um, and really disgraceful that we still haven't been able to improve the service delivery where I live um, for a proportion of young people that's some of the highest in the country. So um, that's really my passion for being involved in the Youth Branch Justice. I feel we have so much potential to use technology to bridge gaps uh, and to reach young people in ways we never have been able to before. Great, thank you. Okay, so this is the Youth Brains Trust, and um, as Lauren said, um, there are some Aidens in the audience, and Marilise spoke earlier. Um, we are so privileged to have the knowledge and the expertise of our Youth Brains Trust, and my board particularly um, treats the Youth Brains Trust probably better than it treats the scientists, and I don't know if Pat and Ian can attest to that, but we have the Youth Brains Trust sitting directly Aside, alongside the scientists. And so the scientists do their scientific um, you know, work. And if the Youth Brains Trust say, actually, it might be a good research idea, but we don't like it, um, the board take that incredibly seriously, send it back to the scientists and say, we're actually, you need to review it and you need to change it. Um, so they are such a fundamental part of our organisation, so fundamental that they named us, they've created our vision, our values. Um, you name it, they are a part of who we are and what we do. Um, you can jump onto the website, and I'm sure someone's tweeted it out, to have a look at the diversity of the young people um, who are a part of our Youth Brains Trust. They come from our partner organisations. We've purposefully worked incredibly hard to get a big diversity of, 
of experience, and I don't know if you want to mention it all or talk about the diversity around it, but they, they really work hard together. We bring them together for uh, two days, and then Chris um, Gesling, who's in the audience somewhere, um, he facilitates continual conversation via technology. And so for us, the technology and the face-to-face -face is important, but the technology actually grows that communication and builds on that communication. So thank you, we're incredibly appreciative. Um, so to why, why is technology so important? I think Jim nailed it when he said, you know, young people are gonna be teaching us as the parents about what they're doing online. And we're certainly pushing that. We're saying, how do we actually empower young people to be our teachers? What does it look like to actually understand the world of a young person from a young person's perspective? Because if you don't believe that technology is important, then I think you're doing yourself a disservice as a professional because for young people it is, as Jack Heath, the founder of the Inspire Foundation says, it's like the air they breathe. It is here, it is here to stay, and to say that it's not uh, important really is not doing a good service to young people. So we run a national service. We've been doing it since the early days of Beyond Blue. It started in 2000 with Ian Hickey, and we did it in 2000, 2003 and 4, again in 2008, and then with the Young Well CRC in 2013. So we have data over the last 13 years around young people's mental health, their well-being, not their technology use, because back in 2000, this is how quickly it all evolves, um, we didn't measure technology, but in 2008 we started measuring technology use. So we have data around mental health, well-being, stigma, help seeking, and how young people are actually using technologies. So this is a slide that Lauren is going to explain to you. Yep. So it's, well, it's pretty self-explanatory really. Um, the slide shows that um, young people are increasingly using smartphones, tablets, laptops, and the poor little computer is getting less and less important. And there may be a range of reasons for that, mobility and just you know the ease of being able to carry around these other things. And um, I don't know, a young person who doesn't have a phone, smartphone attached to them. Um, and just the places that young people are using them. So 75.9% are using these technologies at home in their bedrooms. Now, um, for me, that was really important, particularly from a headspace point of view. I think about e-headspace and um, technologies like that where um, we can now access help from the places that we feel most comfortable. And I think that this is really reflective of young people are seeking information and they're using these technologies in the places they feel um, most comfortable because they now no longer have to be in the library or at school or, you know, in the common area at home. So um, it's at home in the bedroom, um, home in the living room and then school and other public places. So we're getting increasingly mobile. As parents and as professionals, that obviously puts up some morning lights and you think, wow, 24-7 connectivity, how do we ensure that young people are safe in these online spaces? And again, it's why the Young and Well CRC is funded, to help us understand how do we ensure that this device, while giving great access and 24-7 access to a service, isn't abused. And so we want to make sure... You can sure bring mine on stage. <laughs> you can borrow mine. <laughs> So we want to make sure and we want to work directly with young people so that they can be the empowerers, the providers, the, the decision making, makers in this space. So that they can say actually, you know what, it's okay, I'm going to turn off my phone, I'm going to go to bed and have a good night's sleep and um, get up in the morning and yeah, I'll be connected and that's great. For us what it also means, and we did a lot of work around young men's mental health and wellbeing, and what was happening with them was that they were awake at two, three o'clock in the morning. It means that they are accessing services at that time. And unfortunately for the service model that we've got at the moment, it is a face-to-face -face service which says the door opens at nine and it closes at five. And what happens is that in the middle of the night when young people are at their most vulnerable, there's not a service available for them. So one of the things that we're pushing and saying we actually need to think about is how do we ensure that services are available 24-7 so that if your psychiatrist or your psychologist is not there and on hand, you can actually get support when you need it. So the right help, the right time, and when you want it on your terms. Can I just add there, um, one thing that lots of young people have said to me before when we've talked about access to services is that question about why are services open only during school hours with like, you know, a couple of hours either side. We're meant to be at school, we're meant to be at work. So the whole business hours thing is something that kind of boggles your mind a little bit. So you've heard a lot about Headspace and Reach Out and Origin and, and early intervention. 
We think in Australia we have the most fantastic foundation to creating a new model, a new system of mental health care. And we believe that technologies have to be a part of that because it helps us think about how we can actually provide the services to the millions of young people who need those services. No matter what we do, we will never have enough professionals. We won't ever have enough professionals up in the remote communities in Australia. So we need to get smarter about how we actually use these technologies to provide those services to young people. So to just cap off some of the national data, um, and if you're not convinced that technology is important, you've heard from Lauren, you've heard from young people throughout the conference, this is our national data. So this is a, a representative sample, 1,400 young people, computer administered telephone interview um, done by the Brain and Mind Research Institute. So the pink's 2008. So in 2008, 13% of young people were using email. By 2012, it had jumped to 94%. Social networking. Social networking has exploded from 32% to 93%. And digital content creation, actually storytelling and, and getting your message out there. And I, I heard Johnny speak yesterday and he talked about his YouTube clips. 7% um, to 86%. So if you're not convinced that young people are using social media, here is a voice and here is the data, the evidence and the real life experience. People do get concerned about what young people are doing online, and so in the survey we asked them about, well, what is it that you're doing? Um, the majority are online three to four hours a day. Um, they're not online 24-7, but what's interesting is that it's, it's inter interspersed. It's not our traditional way of sitting at a computer and sort of thinking, oh, it's actually walking around, checking your mobile phone, looking at Twitter. But when we asked young people, well, what are you actually doing? They were pretty much doing what we're doing. They were checking the bank, they were um, downloading music, they were um, looking at video clips. They were pretty much using it as a social engagement, social interaction tool. Similar to the ways we'd use it, they might be using different social networks, um, but very similar to the way in which we're using it. Um, when you asked about how they connect and communicate, again, it was, and you can see the huge increase in um, and the shift in the way in which young people are using um, social networking. Really, the digital content creation and the building of social communities around um, sharing and connecting, all the things that we know from a social determinants model about feeling valued, being able to participate, um, being able to connect and build community, they are doing it online. Now, while we might not understand it, it's actually about building on the strengths of young people and sharing and acknowledging. So when you think about, well, what does this mean for mental health? And this is where I'm going to call Ian up, if he can um, wake himself up and jump up on stage. Um, you know, there are risks, and we, we want to make sure that we don't um, increase those risks. But you look at write, writing a blog. So when you think about cognitive behavioural therapy, one of the things that you introduce is you know, keeping a diary and writing a blog and talking about your own um, personal experiences. It's jumped from 1% to 66%. Playing games with others. I had the privilege of going to a gaming conference in Melbourne with 35,000 gamers. Now, I am clearly not a gamer, but what was really clear to me is that these people weren't just sitting at their consoles playing games. They were engaging, interacting, sharing, telling stories, doing a whole host of things about how they were actually using their games and connecting. And the guys from QUT and other universities had done some research work and said actually gaming at the right dose, at the right level, is actually good for you. It helps in stress management, it helps in building positive um, social community and, and connectedness. When we asked them about using online counselling, it jumped from 1% in 2008 to 8% in 2012. So while the commercial world has embraced technologies and we all have social networks and you know, we use Spotify for music and we use um, technologies to, to do our banking, we haven't really used it in a mental health service provision space. And eHeadspace e has just started and we've been really interested in what's happening with them and we're now really working out how do we actually bring this all together into a system of care that is in, not just an adjunct to clinical care, but is a part of the whole focused purpose around it. So I'm going to start by talking to, we, we run major research projects. Um, this one, and, and to just give you an example, there are something like a thousand wellbeing apps out there. So if you're a young person, and again, to use the Johnny example, he said how mindfulness for him was so incredibly important. How do you make sense of those apps? How do you know what's evidence-based? How do you know what's going to be helpful or, or 
uh, a hindrance. So we're working with the Inspire Foundation um, and the Reach Out guys with QUT to say, how do we actually make sense of all of these apps? Um, can we create a rating system? We want to make sure that these are evidence-based, but we also want to make sure that young people are going to use them. And we want to keep it up to date. So the, the guys are working on what we're calling an online wellbeing centre, a toolbox for wellbeing. And um, hearing about all of the great apps that everyone's creating is fabulous, but how do you actually ensure that young people can use them, access them, and then provide input to their friends about what's great and what's not? So, that one, um, Aram's here, have a chat to him if you're interested. The other one, which is, what is that one? Okay, the other one, which is why I've got Ian up here, is how and what would it look like if you were a psychiatrist and I was to come in and have a chat to you as a young person, and I might actually come in via Skype online. So if you were to be a psychiatrist and create a share plan, and remember this is all, a vision, it's not yet created. Um, we've got to do the research to understand what might actually work. As a psychiatrist, you might have an ask the question or a psychologist or a youth worker or a school counselor, you might say, well, what do you do on, a social, on social networks? Who are your friends? What websites do you like? How do you use them? Um, what do they look like? And it actually gives you some insight into who the young person is and what they do. Um, it also allows you to set up the page so that you can actually put on Headspace and Reach Out and um, the Butterfly Foundation's website. So that the young person has that information available to them. You can work with them and say, well, what is it that you like and what do you use? And we did have a slide with all of the mental health services on it, but it seems to have fallen out. But do you want to speak a little bit about yeah, the complexity sure. of the service system? I think it was on a couple of slides ago, just before the apps. That one? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is very much, I think, what um, help seeking and info seeking looks like for a lot of young people. Like I look at that and I can see at least five websites that I've used before. So um, Reach Out's really great and has forums where young people are connecting with each other and sharing stories and having a look at fact sheets and things like that. Hello Sunday Morning, which encourages people to take a break from alcohol and creates a community um, where you blog and you've got a community support to do that. Um, E-Headspace, Anxiety Online, the um, National Eating Disorder Collaboration. So there's a website for everything now, um, but there are really credible organisations who are running really fantastic little resource centres. So um, these are some of the first places we're going to, um, to just get the info that we need or to connect with other young people who are having similar experiences because it's not just about the information, it's also about the support. Um, and a lot of these are, are not just websites, they're communities of, of people, of young people. Okay, a note to myself is to, when I get back to Australia, get some glasses. <laughs> okay, this is the Online Wellbeing Centre, um, the idea of a toolbox of wellbeing resources and apps and, and websites that are available. The one that I'm going to introduce you to, um, Ian, to talk about is the idea of an online clinic and what it might potentially look like. And for those of you who don't know, this is Professor Ian Hickey. Morning, Jane. <laughs> she has woken me up from the back row. And this issue about clinics, I think, is such a fundamental issue. I mean, just the discussions this morning, you know, I feel like I'm back in the 19th century somewhere, perhaps it's the Brighton Dome and whatever. The idea that people come to a place where the professionals are sitting and then they have to tell a story. And then there's all this dialogue about who's welcome, are families welcome, are other siblings welcome, whose story is it? Then there's the issue about the age ranges and the transitions and the setups. Has anyone been actually taking themselves to a bank recently? You know, anyone old enough in the audience remember when you had to go to the bank and stand in the queue to see the person who had your money <laughs> to tell you what you could do or not do with your money in that particular kind of thing? I often feel that, you know, in, in reality, that many other areas of the real world that we operate in, and it is the real world, the banking world, the financial world or whatever, technology has just become an essential part of those worlds. In much of health, as it's going forward, it is your own health that you're managing, more and more encouraged to do that. It's the information you collect around that. And the role of clinicians becomes to become consultants to that, to provide advice, to provide an input. So the whole idea around a virtual clinic is it's not a clinic. It's a person managing their welfare and moving as they do to that certain point, up on top of their uh, wellbeing and the apps, to engage others like clinicians 
who have additional advice. They have a specific issue. <laughs> if you have the financial problems I have, you need to engage <laughs> a financial advisor occasionally. You know, I can't do the whole online thing. There's technical stuff I don't know. I need the advice of someone who does know. But I don't need that person to take over my world. I don't need to, need to go and queue up to see them. I certainly don't need them to control my world. I need their advice. And I need them to partner in a way that's available and it's accessible and to build with me some understandable thing that me and the people who matter to me can be in control of on an ongoing basis. So what we're trying to establish here is an experience which is really like that, where clinicians are really critical technical consultants to the development of these sets of plans, but they're not the people who run the business and they certainly don't hand the business over at critical transitions from one person to another or they don't do it or they suddenly declare they're unavailable to do it because you're the wrong age or the wrong geography or the wrong colour or whatever else. And the technology provides us, I think, with the most fabulous opportunity. So in this whole world, as Jane sort of illustrated here and with many of our colleagues with Pat, with Helen Christians in Australia and, and many others, we're trying to fundamentally think what do we need to do differently that maximises the opportunity that technology provides. And the most fabulous opportunity, just, there's just those numbers that were in the morning, you know, 300 million people, young people currently with a mental health problem, isn't it? You know, three or four times that number, you know, in trouble. Very small numbers getting care. What could care look like that was accessible, that was high quality, that was consultative, that was empowering and is ongoing? You know, doesn't close at nine or five. It doesn't reject you at a certain age. It doesn't only be available for a certain number of sessions, for a certain price, for a certain place. So all of that, and I think this whole idea of trying to find the way in what's really good about clinical practice, what is it that's really essential? Because as sure as hell ain't the bank queuing experience, it certainly ain't the nine to five closed off, it certainly isn't the transitions, it certainly isn't leave your family out, or in this situation, leave your friends and peers out of the whole thing. What is it that we can take and take into the real world of the virtual worlds that we deal with, and then we behave differently. I think I was discussing with people at dinner last night, the really big challenge here is not clearly young people and the technology, it's actually the professions are dinosaurs in this <laughs> setting. You know, we are, just, we are trained and we are continuing to train our young professionals in these highly individualised, highly personalised, but actually highly controlling kind of aspects. You come see us, we control what happens to you, ways of being, which are fundamentally dead in the face of the technologies that we have. They're dead in every other industry. They're dying rapidly in the health industries. Mental health, I think, is at the forefront, one of the greatest opportunities to change how we do things and get over some of the biggest access issues. But the real challenge, the challenge we're facing in this is, how do you take what is really essential about clinical practice? And I think you saw it here with Max and David this morning when they're speaking with people and engaging with people. How do you take that essential elements into this world and I think one of the key things here is a change in mindset, actually, in professionals. That we are consultants too, we're partners too, we have technical advice of a world that's actually been controlled by the person themselves. And that's the way we want it to be, so that these issues can be managed and changed. And I was with the mum this morning, we're scared. We're really scared. <laughs> you know, we don't know what we're doing. We're not good at it. We didn't grow up with this stuff. And we're actually trained in other things. We're trained in a completely different paradigm of working. We think it is possible. I think the bottom line here is we're with the young people we're working minutes. with, with others we're working with, we think we can grab what is the essential element of really good clinical practice and bring it into these sets of environments. But boy, we're on a learning curve. We are on a learning curve. One of the thing that, uh, things that I think is the most exciting and that is probably the most challenging is something that young people are already doing. They are using their phones, they're getting devices like this little wristband to measure their mood, their sleep, their activity. And when you think about mental health and well-being, we know that it's important to look after your sleep and your activity, but we also know that when you're mentally ill, it's impossibly hard to get yourself out of bed. And sometimes the last thing you feel like doing is actually moving. So one of the things that we're exploring is can you actually create a wristband that a young person can wear that gives them immediate biofeedback which maps against their psychological therapy, whether it's a drug therapy or whether it's a, a, a talking therapy, that allows them to see how important things like diet and exercise and sleep is. Because if you can see the data and you can see the little mock-up that I've done, you know, if, you've, if your sleep's good and your mood's good, it's incentive to say, actually, you know, looking after my sleep's really important. If you've got out and gone for a walk, um, and you, your mood improves, then you can map that and you can see that immediate and you can see the feedback. So I'm going to finish there.
unless, Lauren, you have anything else to add. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for being partners in this. I think it's a huge and exciting journey. Um, I also wanted to thank my, my um, guys back in Australia who've absolutely supported the whole Twitter feed. And it really is a community of people who are talking about this. I look at my phone in the morning and I've got the, the Youth Brains Trust from Australia who've all been interested and want to understand what's going on. So when you think about the 500 people in this room, but the potential to reach all of those thousands of people out there um, through the uses of technologies, and I think we've got a fabulous opportunity and we should be grabbing it and using it and not being afraid of it. So thank you.